Cathy and I are very grateful to you for the very warm welcome you've given us. We feel hugely privileged to come and absolutely delighted to be here for your first uh, Keswick in this area and uh, urge you to, as you will, keep praying for it and especially that more people come who are in the under 50 uh, age section. And I say this as a rapidly aging man who's about to retire next year. It would be wonderful to see this grow with plenty of um, um, non-grey heads around, um, though the Lord loves all the ages. Uh, thank you to the organisers who've looked after us so well. We have loved every part of the program, for Greg and the musicians, the uh, mission inputs that we've had each day, the way things have been planned, it's been an absolute treat. And that you would bring a couple across the world to join this just for three talks is a great kindness. Uh, but I do want you to know that after this, uh, we go on to something called Servants of the Word, where I have the privilege of speaking a little more, uh, one or two local churches, and also a house party in the Oxford area. So your bringing me has given me an opportunity to do a number of things, and I'm sure I want to pass on our great gratitude. For those of you who've come up and been friendly, that's been an absolute treat as well. When I was in the English Keswick, I remember telling the English Keswick that I didn't just want people to come up and say hello uh, because they, they were a little bit um, aloof and awkward, and I am too, um, but to come up and give me a hug. And I spent the next week uh, having a whole lot of awkward English men cross the road to give me <laughs> hugs uh, in the middle of the street. Wherever I went, some poor man would come across the road to give me a hug. And I went home with about 12 new strands of flu as well from those <laughs> hopes. So um, perhaps just a quick handshake before I go. We have been trying to look at the very famous men, Elijah and Elisha, in the Old Testament. You know that they are, in a way, captains of prophecy. They are the ones who, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration, where you've got Moses representing the law, you've got Elijah representing the prophets. They're the captains. They are the, the absolute leaders in, or the symbolic leaders of prophecy. And what we've done for the last two nights is to look twice at Elijah, once as his ministry begins, and then last night we saw the great success on Mount Carmel, and then the deflation which followed so quickly. Now, we have one evening left, and I want to take one opportunity to look at Elisha. And uh, at the risk of some indigestion, I want to go with you quite quickly through the lead-up for Elisha and get to the point where Naaman, the famous general, is cured of his leprosy, and Elisha's servant Gehazi seems to walk into great judgment. So the plan is that we're going to try and look across a bit of two kings, and this is a little bit of a flyover, but I'm sure you can follow with me just by listening. And what I want to do is turn, first of all, to one, uh, 2 Kings chapter 2. You may have a Bible, you may be just listening, and I want to tell you about the handover from Elijah to Elisha. Why are we doing this? Because... Two things. First of all, we are persuaded that God works in his world by his word. The pressure is on everywhere to do something different. But God works with his word. And I've been in my church for nearly 30 years, and I have the huge privilege of watching the word do its work in keeping couples together in seeing lost people believe, in seeing children come through the Sunday school and the youth group and now teaching the Sunday school and leading the youth group and even some in mission overseas. It's been an absolute privilege for me. And all I have simply done with all inadequacies is to keep teaching the word in the church building. And God works through his word and I'm trying to press this upon you and if possible, even to model the handling of God's word. So the handover from Elijah to Elisha takes place in 2 Kings 2. 
And we ought to be asking as we read 2 Kings 2, which we're not going to do because there isn't time, but we ought to be asking if we were reading the chapter is not just what does the chapter say, but why does the chapter say it? For example, we're reading that Elijah succeeds, Elisha succeeds Elijah, but why? Well, because God is in the business of making sure that his word keeps going. And when Elisha takes over from Elijah, we read in chapter 2 that there is a miracle, water is made clean, and there is a judgment. Mocking boys are killed. This uh, story in 2 Kings 2, this event, this historical event of the boys who come out to mock Elisha, is actually chapter 1 in a book of J.C. Ryle's on stories for children. Just imagine having your children tucked up in bed. <laughs> Today we're going to read about a disobedient boy who was eaten by bears. <laughs> now sleep well and I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> now why are these events recorded in 2 Kings chapter 2? We just need to give a little bit of reflection. We need to think. Elisha is Elijah's apprentice. Elijah is going to leave. Elisha wants to go with him wherever he goes, but he cannot. Elisha is going to be left to do the work. And he takes on the task of God's word. And the word of God is a two-edged sword. It brings blessing and cursing. Which is why in the very chapter where Elisha begins his ministry, there is a blessing and there is a cursing. The city water is made clean. There's the blessing. We know that water is hugely significant in the Bible and in the days of Elijah and Elisha, hugely significant. And in the ministry of Jesus, water, hugely significant. And here is Elisha beginning his ministry and there is a miracle where polluted water is made clean. And then there is this cursing where these probably teenage boys come out and mock the man of God and therefore mock the word of God and mock God himself. And this curse comes down on them and they are killed. And a great warning must have gone out to all that area that to take God's word seriously was to be greatly blessed and turn your back on it is to be dangerously cursed. So that's the handover of chapter 2. Now, how does Elisha come into prominence? That's 2 Kings chapter 3. And this is my second point, the international impact of Elisha, 2 Kings 3. If you were to read 2 Kings chapter 3, especially as a preacher on a Saturday night, if you'd left your preaching preparation way too long, you'd be scratching your head and looking for another text because it is an amazingly complicated and strange chapter. Kings fighting in the ninth century BC. Who cares? But God is at work to establish his word. We read in Psalm 138 verse 3, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And God wants the nations to hear of him. And so God creates a chink in the armor of the king of Israel. Uh, he's a very ungodly man. He's not as bad as King Ahab. He's selectively evil. How is God going to reach this ungodly king who has taken over from King Ahab? The answer is that he's going to bring a chink into his armor. And what he does is he causes the nearby king of Moab to decide to no longer pay for the wool that comes. They cancel their payment for the wool supply. So it's a national disaster for Israel. And the king of Israel plans that he will conduct war against the king of Moab. And he goes and invites two other kings to come and join him, the king of Judah and the king of Edom. I wish I could spend an hour now on talking to you about how God brings a chink into the armor of people who are inflated or pompous or rebellious and causes them to come humbly back to him. But we don't have time. This is one good example. And the three kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom head off to fight the king of Moab. 
And they're a very mixed bunch. The king of Israel distrusts God when they run out of water. But the king of Judah trusts God and says, is there a prophet anywhere who can tell us what to do? And one of the soldiers says, there's a man called Elisha. And so they go to meet Elisha. The kings go to meet the prophet. The kings are helpless. They go to the prophet. And Elisha the prophet says, I don't even know why I'm talking to you. If it wasn't for the godly king of Judah, I would not talk to you. But he goes on to say to them, water will come. God will be gracious to you. And it will be miraculous. And you will also win a victory over the Moabites. And the next morning, the water arrives in the valley. And it's quite bizarre because the Moabites wake up in the morning and they see the water in the distance. And one of them makes a decision based on his eyes, which is that the water in the sunlight looks like blood. And he announces that there must have been a great battle and they're thrown into confusion. And to cut a long story short, the three kings of Israel, Judah and Edom win an easy victory. I thought it was wonderful when the words went off the screen and we had to stop in our tracks because it's just a reminder of how much we need the word. I thought it was very clever of the organizers to do this. <laughs> I mean, here in the middle of the conference, I needed an illustration that we are pretty helpless without the word. And they found a way of showing it for us. Well, by the time this victory has taken place, the whole of Israel and the whole of Judah and the whole of Edom and the whole of Moab, all the nations know that Yahweh is real and reliable. And Elisha is the servant speaking the word. So Elisha takes over from Elijah. His word is immediately a cause of blessing or cursing. Then in chapter 3, he comes to international prominence and in chapter 4, I want you to notice, if you are looking at the chapter, that you suddenly see all the blessings that come from God's Word. I would call this the dimensions of the Gospel. And when you read 2 Kings chapter 4, it's a lovely chapter, and it strings together four miracles. There's the widow and the jar of oil. You remember the lady who goes and collects all the jars? And the Lord keeps filling the jars, and she pays off her debts. And then there is the raising of the boy who dies back to life. And then there is the water which is poisoned, being restored so that they can drink it. And then there is the feeding of a small crowd with a few loaves of bread, something that Jesus, of course, will fulfill on a much bigger scale. But as you're reading 2 Kings chapter 4 and you're scratching your head thinking, why has the writer put this in? I think it is, and I've gained this insight from a friend in Sydney. I think it is because we are being shown all the blessings of the gospel. That God is a God who removes our debts. That God is a God who raises the dead. That God is a God who sets us free from danger. And God is a God who fills our empty souls. Four beautiful miracles, all to be, as I say, fulfilled perfectly in Jesus so God, you see, establishes his new servant, Elisha. He gives him the word. Elisha begins his ministry. He soon has international prominence. And now we come to this very famous event with Naaman, the soldier from Syria in 2 Kings 5. And again, we might ask ourselves the question, not just what does the chapter 5 say, but why is it there? Why does God give us 2 Kings 5? Naaman gets rid of his leprosy. Gehazi gets leprosy. Why are we given the chapter? I hope you scratch your head every now and again and think not just what does it say, but why does it say it? And I hope if you're a teacher or a preacher, you scratch your head every now and again and you say not just what does it say, anybody can see what it says. But why does it say it? I have a rule with my young assistants at church that if we were more dissatisfied with our preaching, our people might be more satisfied. 
It's when we're easily satisfied, our people who are thinking in the pews are more dissatisfied. And we ought to be asking ourselves, what is 2 Kings 5 all about? Now, I want to suggest to you that 2 Kings 5 is teaching at a very on-the-ground level, what does it look like for a man who's completely far away to walk into the blessing of God's Word? That's Naaman. And what does it look like for a man who's in the circle of blessing to walk away from the Word of God? That's Gehazi. In other words, here's a chapter which gets right down to the ground and says, in the end, every single individual in this world is either going to take steps to God or steps away from God. I heard a lovely story recently, and uh, I read this morning Spurgeon said that uh, the devil shouldn't have all the humor. And uh, this is a story I heard, and I thought it was such a useful story of uh, Tiger Woods meeting Stevie Wonder in a pub. And uh, they meet for the first time in the pub, and Stevie Wonder, the blind singer, says to Tiger Woods, the golfer, you know, when my drive is off, my whole game is off. And Tiger Woods says to him, what are you talking about? You're blind. And Stevie Wonder says, that's absolutely no problem to me. I still play golf. In fact, I'm playing off uh, off one, which is a very able golfer. And Tiger Woods says, that's incredible, how does it work? And uh, Stevie Wonder says, well, I've got a caddy who waits down the fairway, and he calls to me, and I hit the ball towards him. And when we get to the green, the caddy stands behind the pin, and I putt towards him, and he calls to me. And it works very well, which is why I'm playing off one nearly scratch. Tiger Woods says, we must have a game sometime. Stevie Wonder says, nobody takes me seriously. I won't play for less than $1,000 a hole. Tiger Woods thinks for a minute and says, that would be fine. Stevie Wonder says, you pick a night. (laughs) Is that not a helpful story? There is somebody who has to walk blindly down the road and there is a word that calls to him. You and I walk blindly down the road, so does everybody in this country, and there is one who walks, as it were, down the road ahead of us to call with a voice in order that we might walk by faith, a loving, authoritative, sovereign voice. So let's think now to 2 Kings chapter 5, and I'll read you a few verses. Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, which is Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king king replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? He's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message, why have you torn your robes? Have this man come to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him to say, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. 
Are not the rivers of Bana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? And he turned and went in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like a young boy. I want to just show you quickly the steps from Naaman to Yahweh. First of all, he was a very long way away. Chapter 5, verse 1, he was an army leader in Syria. What hope of reaching an army leader in Syria? We're told that even his victories, however, were made possible by God, and so we can be absolutely sure that God can reach anybody he wants to. You remember in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that Babylon invaded Jerusalem, and then we're told in the very same verse that God gave Jerusalem to Babylon. That's the real secret. Nobody breathes unless God enables them. And God is interested in the nations. So he's a long way away. Second, there is a chink in his armor. He has leprosy. This probably means the end of his career. I don't know how the Syrians dealt with leprosy, but in Israel we know a person would be pushed out of society. But here is Naaman. He's got leprosy. It probably means the end of his career and maybe the end of his life. He must therefore face his mortality. Malcolm Muggeridge says, the ultimate disaster that can befall us is to feel ourselves to be at home here on earth. The ultimate disaster that can befall us, how would you finish that? Is to think that we're here forever. To live as if we'll always be here. As if this place is all that matters. That's the ultimate disaster. Well, no tracts are reaching Naaman. He would have pushed them away. But now he's got no answers and he's become very receptive. Third step, somebody witnesses to him. A little girl witnesses to the great commander and says there is a man called Elisha. She's heard of him. Elisha, who's begun his ministry and become famous, is now going to be used to reach or to help somebody so far away. If Naaman had heard news of Elisha when he was well, he would have considered to be extremely boring. But now he thinks the news of Elisha could be what he needs. Would that everybody who was in the grip of their death Turn to Christ. I went to visit a man in hospital recently. Some people sent me a message and said, would you go and visit him? He's a friend of ours. And I went to see him and I said to him, how are you? And he said, I'm dying. I'm here to die. I said, do you have any faith? He said, I believe all of that is science fiction. And he then became extremely hostile and attacked everything I said. And he's just died. I hope and pray that things that I said and prayed with him made some difference. We need, don't we, to say to our listeners that unless we see the danger of our sin and the evil of our sin, that sin is being at war with God and shaking the fist in his face. It's a deep thing, sin. It's a terrible thing. It's a corrupt thing. It's a fatal thing. And see the wonder of salvation that Jesus has come to pay our debts, to lift the danger off our back. Unless we see these two things, we stay in the darkness and it just gets darker. Just as a couple cannot really make any progress when they're having marriage difficulties, when they're blaming each other, but they often make great progress when they can see their own personal faults and are amazed that the other person even stays with them, So a person will make some progress when they see and face their sin and then go to Christ for forgiveness. So God gave to Naaman a certain amount of desperation and a solution. Fourth step, Naaman's theology of works was demolished. 
He heads off with money and gifts. Why does he head off with money and gifts? Well, because that's how the world does things. Pays for them. The world says nothing is free. And religion says nothing is free. And the gospel says it comes freely. And the poor king of Israel feels the pressure. How's he possibly going to heal this man, Naaman? It looks like a plan for war. But God is not looking for payment, and Elisha is not looking for payment, even when Naaman pressures him to take some money. I wonder when you take the Lord's Supper on a Sunday, or what you call communion, or whatever you call it, I wonder if you recognize that as you take the communion, we hold out an absolutely empty hand. And then we're given the symbols of God's saving power. And we take them in. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. I have nothing. Christ gives me himself. And I take him in. The fifth step is that there is an announcement that there is one way for Naaman to be clean. Elisha doesn't come out and grovel and says, well, this is astounding that we've got somebody so famous. I don't know what to say. Nothing like that. He sends a message, go and wash in the river. It's quite insulting to Naaman's pride, but it's designed to take him down a few notches. And he's told to go and wash seven times, and it must have been extremely humiliating for him in front of his soldiers and friends to have walked down into that muddy river and then have walked out again. And leprosy is still all over his body. And he says to himself, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. And he goes down a second time and he comes out and there's leprosy all over his body. And then he goes down a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and then a seventh. And as he comes out, his skin is beautifully clean. He's learned, hasn't he, that there is one way to be clean. And the sixth and the final step is that Naaman is now outwardly clean. And remarkably, he's inwardly changed. He says in verse 15, now I know that God is the only God. He doesn't say, I know that God is helpful. Do you know, friends, that there are churches in the world today who are subtly teaching that God is just helpful to your agenda? Do watch out for those. The churches that keep talking about God and Jesus and Bible and cross and heaven and hell, but you are at the center of the solar system. Watch out for those. Naaman says, I know now there's only one God. He's not just helpful. I'm privileged to meet him. This is exactly what someone says when they're converted to Christ. They suddenly say, there is only one way. No one else can forgive my sins. No one else can open the door into glory. Why talk about other religions? And we, when we're loving, we, per- we press people to Christ, don't we? It's like being in a room where there's uh, seven locked doors and one open door. If you know there's one open door, you don't say to people, take your choice of a door. You push them to the open door. When you're on the Titanic and the lifeboats, you've checked them, have all got holes in them. But one of the lifeboats has got no holes you'll push people to the lifeboat with no holes. When you know that Jesus has died and risen, you love them by pushing them towards Jesus. And the fruit is seen in Naaman's life because he suddenly is finished with idolatry. He says in chapter 5, verse 17, please, can I take back some earth to my country? Because I want to be a person whose allegiance is to this place, and this God, and this message. Real Christianity sees that Jesus is the only way, the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. Now let's just quickly think about Gehazi, and I'll just read you a few verses. 
Naaman goes on his way. After he'd traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, you know, my master was too easy on Naaman by not accepting what he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from the chariot and said, is everything all right? Everything's all right, said Gehazi. My master has sent me to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman, and he urged Gehazi to accept them, tied them up in two talents of silver in two bags with two sets of clothing and gave them to two of his servants and they carried them ahead. When Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the house. He sent the men away and they left. And when he went in and stood before his master Elisha, Elisha asked him, where have you been? Your servant didn't go anywhere, said Gehazi. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take money or to accept clothes? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you. And Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Is this chapter teaching us that God brings the furthest, furthest person to himself? step by step. And there is the danger of the closest person, and I mean religiously. I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about the person who's got all the privileges of hearing and sitting and singing and maybe believing parents or believing family or believing friends but step by step they walk away, all the way into judgment. So like the Sermon on the Mount, this chapter finishes with a crash. Here's a man, Gehazi, he's got huge privileges, but he walks away. I want you to just see the steps very quickly. First, he is very privileged. He has been hearing and seeing of Yahweh from Elisha. He could not have a better role model He's even seen miracles take place. He can talk the talk. As he runs off, do you notice what he says? As the Lord lives, he can talk the talk. I have people in my church who can talk the talk. I don't think the lights are on. But they know how to say the things that impress the church. Maybe that's you. Secondly, he follows his sinful heart. He says in verse 20, my master missed his opportunity. I will go and get something. People today will tell you to follow your heart. The Bible says the heart is deeply corrupt. The heart of the unbeliever moves away from Christ all the time. To follow the heart is suicidal. The heart of the believer is mixed and divided. We must be following the will and the word of God. Gehazi's heart is obviously fixed in the world and that's where he goes and that's what he wants. His actions speak louder than hymns or Sunday talk. Now don't let me discourage you. We will always be pressured by sin in our heart, by the world, and sometimes tricked by the devil. The question is, do we want to settle down and marry the sin? And if the answer is no, praise God, because that's God at work. We cannot settle down with sin, which seems to be what Gehazi is doing. Thirdly, he plots like a genius He's had no classes in evil, but he is so good at it. He chases Naaman down the road and he says, first of all, you know, Elisha sent me. What a lie. He then invents a story of need. Some people have arrived. Lie number two. He borrows the servants to carry things back, then gets rid of the servants before anybody sees them. 
And then he stands in front of Elisha like a little four-year-old boy. And Elisha says, where have you been? He said, I've not been anywhere. Unbelievable, isn't it? I can't think of anybody who could be that corrupt until I'm shaving in the morning and I'm looking at somebody who can be just that corrupt. Is this not a window on the human heart? Have there not been times where we have planned and plotted to do something sinful and we've done it like a genius? Well, Gehazi thinks his secret is a secret, but nothing, of course, is a secret to God. And so, finally and fourthly, he receives his penalty. He becomes leprous. He looked at grace and said, I'd prefer sin. He listened to grace and said, I am going to go after the world, and he got judgment. Naaman listens to grace. Gehazi despises grace. Naaman listens to grace and is saved. Gehazi despises grace and is destroyed. And is that verse 26 not a powerful question? Is this the time to be living like this? Is this the time for the standard of the church to be so low? You see what Elisha is saying to Gehazi? The nation of Israel is idolatrous. Things are terrible. The nations know nothing. Suddenly a man comes and hears grace from us and is saved. Is this the time to mess up the gospel? So Gehazi went as we see and he was white as snow. It's a very memorable phrase, white as snow, isn't it? It's a terrible phrase, and it's a wonderful phrase. To refuse grace, like Gehazi, is to end up with skin white as snow, a deadly disease. To receive grace, Isaiah chapter 1, is to find that your soul is as white as snow. Because in the grace of God, the Son of God takes your sin on himself and gives to you the righteousness of his own performance. Hebrews chapter 10 says, By his one sacrifice he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. As you walk out this evening, say to yourself, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross When he died 2,000 years ago with my sin on his back, he made me perfect forever in his sight. And he's slowly but surely making me holy. What a wonderful king to belong to. So there are two highways in 2 Kings 5, and they revolve around the word of God. One is the, the road, the highway to Yahweh, and one is the road away. One is unbelievably wonderful. One is unbelievably terrible. Everybody you bump into this week is walking one of those two roads. They're either walking to Christ or they're walking away. They're either bicycling to Christ or they're bicycling away. They're either open to to Christ or they're closed. They're in the sunrise or they're in the sunset. They're in the privilege of salvation or they have the judgment hanging over them. They're on the narrow road or they're on the broad road. They're going to get a great welcome at the end or they're going to get a terrible depart at the end. They're going to end up in heaven forever or hell forever. It's a very serious but wonderful gospel that we have for people. Don't stop praying for opportunities. Don't stop asking God to use you. One morning I got up and I said to the Lord as I looked around the window, through the window of my house at all my neighbours, I've had such feeble conversations with them and they've shown no interest at all and I honestly sometimes don't know how to cross the gulf. And I prayed, for me, quite an animated prayer, saying to the Lord, if you don't do something, I cannot do this. I don't even know how to start a conversation with my strange neighbours. 
And when I do, they shut the conversation down so quickly. I give them something. I don't know what happens to it. I invite them to something. They don't come to it. And I went down to the local shop and in the evening, and I got myself a pizza. Kathy was away, and I don't know how to solve any problems when Kathy's away. So I got myself a pizza, and I sat on the bench beside the train station, and a girl was sitting on the other end of the bench, and she said, um, this is your dinner? And I said, yes. She said, uh, what do you do for a job? It's always a great question. I said, I work for the Anglican Church to help people hear about Jesus Christ. She said, oh, I know nothing about Jesus Christ. Tell me something. And we had this wonderful conversation. I only tell you that because I am absolutely hopeless, keen but hopeless, to change anybody's life. But if we were to ask God just on a more regular and urgent basis for opportunities that only he can do, we may see something take place. Let me finish with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We see them through the lens of the Bible, on the road to Christ or the road away. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. If anyone is in Christ, new creation has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God bless you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very precious word. We ask that you would forgive us for the many times we have neglected or skimmed, mishandled, not listened, not done. We thank you for your patience, your mercy, your steadfast love, shown supremely in the work of Christ on the cross, in which we see exactly what your character is like all the time. And we pray that you would help us, Heavenly Father, as you've given us the ministry of reconciliation and we don't really know what to do. We may know what to say, but we don't know how to get the bridges in place. Help us to be loving and wise, and would you help us to cross bridges that would see people hear and believe and live. We ask that you would wonderfully work so that many who are far away would come, and we pray that you would prevent many who are near from walking away. Please hear our prayer and accept our thanks for Jesus' sake. Amen.